If my hands were anything other than hands, if my hands were anything other than hands, if my hands were anything other than hands, they would be two shooting stars galloping light across the galaxy. They would be a twin fandango of diamond-studded fingerprints hopscotching a radiant neon merengue of light from each folded velvet edge of midnight into every tidy galaxy of 14 carat suns. My shooting star hands would reach and leap and turn the faces of every burning celestial pedestrian star-grazed and gazing bright-eyed, amazed, and awestruck as my shooting star hands whip by in a flurry of pirouette spitting sparks and spilling light like each finger is a silver big flip light of flicking flames of hope into the open faces of those twinkling pale and incandescent sisters whose tears glisten and litter the blistering avenue like sequins, I say now. Can you see it? How our shooting star hands could wow and bow them right out of their everyday orbits, turn their glowing dashboard Virgin Mary faces into an illuminated orchestra of rubies and gladiolas right before your very eyes. If my hands were anything other than hands, they would be a street corner jazz quintet. They would be a ten-fingered symphony of saxophones, trombones, clarinets, violins, trumpets, wailing, rowdy, loud, and proud right out from under my fingernails. The song would swell and sing. It would ring itself from lampposts and reach into people's houses and bring mothers and sons come to dance in the middle of the street, stopping traffic. People would get out of their cars and just dance, and things would be all song and dance and celebration. And perhaps then, if my hands were a big bad jazz band, I would send my fingers flying in a furious hurricane of eighth notes to slap right into the faces of any slick gun toting mama jamma who would come to steal my brother's breath. Be be all song and dance and celebration, even the police would be dancing. <laughs> if my hands were anything other than hands, they would be two magic wands. They would be ten abracadabra fingers for me to bring back every bebop biscuit bacon grandmother that we ever lost, every sweet and remarkable friend that we didn't realize was quite so sweet or remarkable until death came and stole them from under our breath or while we was looking over our shoulder at the bus stop, then all of a sudden, they were gone. And for a moment, if my hands were magic wands, I would bring them back. For a moment, we could have them, and we could hold them. We could wrap our arms around them and make the eye contact. For a moment, Things could be so much good or so much better than they ever were before. If my hands were anything other than hands, they would be an entire conversation of miracles for me to cure you of any cancer that ever ailed you. They would be a conjure woman's cupboard of spells and incantations, and I would reach right through your aching, breaking breastbone to ease your heartache if my hands were anything other than hands. They would be a tangible forgiveness that I could just rub into your skin like lotion. Have forgiveness just leaping from person to person to person more infectious than HIV, tuberculosis, and hatred put together. <laughs> if my hands were anything other than hands, they would be mirrors and I would shine them. 
right up to your face so that you could see yourself as immutably remarkable in the constellation of miracles that you are. And you would never ever try to hate yourself to death ever again. If my hands were anything other than hands, they would be two turntables and a microphone. Yeah, if my hands were anything other than hands, they would be two shooting stars galloping light across the galaxy. Thank you. It is entirely possible that you don't know how beautiful you are. I don't expect that with the corporate marketing machines that exist in our society today, that it is being communicated to you how profoundly beautiful you are in your existence and your breath and your complications and the, and the tangled web of lives that we must contend with on it every day, but I must assert in my presence and my breath and my lungs here today that you carry with you a beauty so profound that it is transformative. So do not believe people, whether they be on television or magazines or be Donald Trump, <laughs> don't believe people when they try to convince you um, that you are anything less than extraordinary. On a daily basis, you're extraordinary. The fact that you made it through, that your parents made it through, that their people made it through. You carry all of that with you. Um, so no matter where you've been, you can hold your head up high. I believe in the power of art. We starting now, you can let people back in. <laughs> oh, it's nothing like performing and people coming into the theater, y'all, ain't it? And you're like, okay, I see that you're trying to be quiet and be like, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> yeah, so. Thanks for holding the door, y'all. Because <laughs> didn't we just have a moment together? For real. Oh, we are all here together. I believe in the power of art. I believe in the power of art, and I believe in the power of love. And I do not always distinguish between those two things. I don't think that's important. I believe in the power of art. I believe in the power of love, and it is that which has the, uh, the stakes which are most high in my life. It is a matter of life and death. For me, quite literally, um, let us all say this phrase together. If you also can say that it is true for you, I want you to think for a moment if it is true for you. If it is not, I will, this is not the Pledge of Allegiance. I'm not forcing y'all. <laughs> to say that, to say it, but consider this for a moment. And if it is something that you also believe for yourself, I would invite us to uh, to be of to be of one voice in this matter, shall we? On the count of three, who is there? Someone here who would like to count us to three? Perhaps this lovely young man, and we're in a tie. That's what I'm talking about. Yo, you don't have to, it's up to you. No pressure, you were busy, I see that. <laughs> would you like to count us to three? No? Can I, would anyone, you would like to count us to three? It's not often, oh God, thank you for doing that. I, oh, I'm ready, we ready. One, two, three. I believe in the power of art, yes. Now I want, oh, and this is, one of the last audience participatory things I'm going to ask you to do. <laughs> so no pressure. I'm not going to ask anybody to get up and do interpretive dance while we go through the rest of the talk. Um, now I, I would like you to reconsider this phrase and to say it 
as though it has the power by dint of making it verbal to heal something. So would you say it differently if you believed that it could shrink a tumor? Would you say it differently if you believe that it will stop a policeman at the end of his shift from killing some black kid who also loves art and who's walking away from him? Would you say it differently? And then what you think the tool of it could do? So I want you to consider what you want it to do, and then we're going to say it again. Cool? That's the last high pressure. One of the last high pressure things. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Who wants to count this time, please? Thank you, love. I appreciate you, because you are wearing a shirt with a rainbow on it, and that's, that's meant to be. All right, you ready? I believe in the power of art. Yes, it is so. I believe in the power of art. I believe in the power of love. This is the cycle with which I live my life. I'm a very intense human being. I, like, I don't do time away from this truth. I don't clock in and clock out of it. Nothing in my life is called a project. So the cycle for me, my living cycle, my cycle of dimensional living as a, a whole human being um, focuses on love, being alive where I live, the actual neighborhood geography, and the work of that. And by work, I mean using that which I believe in intentionally and strategically. So I don't sort of flounder around it. Um, I, I think intentionally, and I strive to be as brave as I can with this, and the center of this cycle for me is art. This is my front porch in a neighborhood in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania called Homewood, and um, at the time that this was shot, the FBI stats has ho had Homewood as one of the most dangerous places in the country for black people to be killed by other black people, because it's a small neighborhood, but the amount, the accumulation of death that we were having was statistically astronomical. So the center of this cycle of love and where I live and the work, the intention and the strategy is art. Um, and I said that this for me has the highest stakes. I'm thinking about art and love um, as the driving force in my life and, um, and that which keeps me alive. This figure here is called Power Figure to Keep Me Alive. And um, I've attempted suicide seriously three times. The last time I decided to put to test this phrase that people had been sort of telling me my whole life, and that was that art is powerful. And I was like, didn't you see that on the back of a bumper sticker somewhere? What do you mean art is powerful? What does power mean? What does art mean? And so I came to a place in my life in my 20s where I was so sort of devastated by all the sort of mental and emotional machinations it was taking me to stay alive in a, in a, in a world where um, sort of all of my attempts at, at being what the world said was successful were devastating. And so I, I came to a place where I realized I don't have to take pills to kill myself. I don't have to shoot myself. I could will myself to death. I could sit in this chair right here and I could just die if I wanted to. And I felt like that was a dangerous understanding for me to have. So I did what Lauren Hill did, which was like put it to test scientifically. And I said, let me see what it means. Um, let me see if art has power. And so what I did every day for six months was go down into my basement and I would only allow myself to touch objects that made me feel something. I would walk my dogs through my neighborhood and I would pick things up off the ground unapologetically. I trained myself to uh, trust the feeling of yes inside of myself. And I began to refuse anything that confounded that, anything that confused it. Everything that crystallized it could stay, anything that didn't went. I would work with objects and move objects around and stack objects in a way that was pleasing to my soul. And I made a series of power figures. This is called Power Figure to Keep Me Alive, and it was tedious, every single bead on that face by hand. Uh, but something transformative happened to me in this time. I would be down in my studio, and as those of you who are artists here, um, any type of artist, you've probably experienced the thing where time flips on itself. So I'm down in the studio 18 hours, 
fill in like six minutes. Not having to go to the bathroom, but drinking water out of an old gallon, milk gallon container. Mm-hmm. Putting water into my body to nourish and to co- maintain the energy with which to work, but time changed. And in that change, uh, the, in my, my altered perception of time, I found that I could uh, lend my free mind to attend to any issues or concerns in my heart. So my hands would be at this task, at this, at this repetitive task, one black seed bead at a time, um, 18 keys strung individually, uh, prayer beads I'll talk about, were all wrapped and swaddled meticulously, and my hands and my heart and my body are at this task and my mind and my spirit um, elevated. And, and, and it was like I could have conversations with myself and I could attend to that which was broken inside of me. So the time became very healing. And at the end of that six months, I had these, these figures that I called power figure, and this is called power figure to keep me alive. Um, technically, everything that is inside of this sculpture means something. Every object is like a word that completes a sentence, that completes a paragraph. Anytime you see keys in my work, those keys mean forgiveness. Internal forgiveness, external forgiveness. Anytime you see one of those old bird salt and pepper shakers, it holds the space for the women who did domestic work. My grandmother used to call herself a domestic. I, w- I was like, Grandma, like a domestic thing is like an object in a section, the domestic section of Kmart where you can get the ironing board and the iron and the broom. Why you call yourself a domestic? She said, that's what we called ourselves. But there was a time when these salt and pepper shakers were placed on the table. And I think about those objects. I think now how scientists are actually articulating how you leave a cloud of yourself behind everywhere you go and on everything you touch. Right? And scientists now saying this thing that Native Americans and indigenous people have always known. But science is like, well, yeah, uh, that's, we can confirm that. <laughs> uh, yeah, and all my Native friends are like, it takes them so long. <clears throat> no, for real. Like, anybody heard that study late last year where scientists were like, oh, sage is cleansing. My Ojibwe friends were like, oh, and y'all massacred us for that, <laughs> which is sort of, you, you, it, we all know. Maybe some of us don't, but you're going to know. So everything means something. Uh, technically, this figure is made out of an old white baby doll. I was a kid. I always wanted dolls that felt a certain way, and they were never around, so I decided to just start making what I felt. Um, So we're talking about that cycle, live, work, love. Live, high stakes, art. I believe in the power of art. I believe in the power of love at the center of his art. I grew up in LA. I grew up in LA in the 80s. I grew up in LA understanding what an AK-47 was. I grew up in LA when the phrase drive-by shooting was coined. And I was really surprised to come to the 2000s in a neighborhood in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania and find that there was so much black death. I was like, oh, we didn't learn the lesson. We didn't learn it. Um, And not only was there so much black death, there was also this sort of collective societal shrug. That's how black people die. All all those black folks in the hood, they just must be used to that. You just get used to it. You have a secret organ in your black body to absorb the grief and the trauma of black death. It's not true. There is no extra organ inside black folks that allows them to absorb the grief and the trauma of oppression. It does not exist. It's horrible. And it's also quiet. People don't talk about it. So I made this image because it was too much. This is a hidden graffiti field in Homewood. My friend William owns it. William runs for Senate every, every, every election cycle. <laughs> I vote for him every election cycle. <laughs> um, you know, some of us do vote for William. Uh, so this is that love and that intentional strategy at work where I live, that cycle again. Um, I make power, the power figures called crackers, y'all. White person said to me at a show, what, what do you mean by crackers? 
And I was like, <laughs> I was like, do you want to now? <laughs> In front of everybody? You okay? Sit down. <laughs> so I make the work, and there's some point in the work where I just take it in the neighborhood, or I get on a bus, and I sit it next to me on the bus. <laughs> I just want to, and, I, I, and then I allow conversations to arise while walking through the street with the sculpture. <laughs> and sometimes I have my lovely friends photograph me on street corners. <laughs> this photograph is called Gun with the Wind. Look at my face. Look at all that black pain, y'all. <laughs> oh, all I could have done to make it better was show my fist. Whew, and I am wearing a sheet that I turned into a skirt, y'all. You can do anything when you put your mind to it. You have everything that you need. Oh, this is the, you know, you know Billy Strayhorn? I used to think of all the come what may places. The sudden he took piano lessons in this house. It's across the street from the row house I lived in in Homewood. Um, the uh, N.T. family, uh, there was a grand piano in the house because the kid who lived in that house grew, grew up in the 30s and 40s, he uh, was a piano prodigy and will openly admit to you to this day as he's still alive that he had a nervous breakdown when he was 13. Um, and he became a hoarder, stayed in this house, and they couldn't get the piano out, so they broke it. And at one point, I have a photograph of that crane lifting the harp of the piano out of the house. Um, and we had, my friend, we would stand every day that they demolished this house. Oh, it, it, the sorrow was so heavy. We would just sort of stand there. And my neighbor, who's an amazing fiber artist named Tina Williams Brewer, she did the brave thing one day and she crossed the street and she told the, the young black men who were working to demolish that house who lived in that house and what they meant to us. And after that, those men would save everything and they would, I got the fur, ladies fur coat, I got a photo album of black folks from 1890 to like the 1950s and they started to become these like urban street corner anthropologists, archaeologists, and they did whatever they could, and I was so proud of them, and it meant so much to me. That guy you see right there stood in that dumpster, and he would just hand me things. He would just hand me things, and he, he did whatever he could. Um, so there's sorrow in this, but this is also an enormous pile of art supplies. <laughs> it's true! Aren't you know? Where's Marta? Right, Marta, in that art supplies, that's the truth, yeah. right? Because y'all know the earth doesn't throw anything away. The earth is like, you know you can use that again, right? <laughs> uh, keys scraped up off the, the basement floor of there, and there's so much forgiveness that, that needs to move around us wherever you see keys in the work, and you see them in the work here. Um, and those are my hands. My hand, people said, well, always tell me, my, my, your hands look like your mother's hands. My mom died two years ago of cancer, and she was an artist, and I have the same birthmark that she had. Uh, a crack addict sold me a photo album, and this photo was in it, and it's a photo of Homewood from the 30s. Two bucks, two, two dollars. Uh, but he definitely sold it to the right person. Uh, I'm a citizen. My favorite part of the definition of citizen is an inhabitant, and I work to fully and dimensionally inhabit every part of myself. That's my birthright. Uh, when the Constitution says unalienable, it means to be able to fully dimensionally inhabit your humanity. But do we mean that? Right? I mean it for myself. 
So I call myself a citizen artist. I'm a self-taught artist. I, I sometimes call myself a mother-taught artist because one of the ways that my mother kept us safe in Los Angeles and kept us alive was by making us make things. Uh, so like other kids were out in the neighborhood skateboarding and doing all this fun stuff. And my mother was like, you should make some stuff right now. We'd be like, uh, but then you get into it. Um, and so I call myself a citizen artist after like this really devastating experience I had uh, joining an MFA crit class at Carnegie Mellon and talking uh, with the students about their work and afterwards their comment to me was, why does she start all of her, uh, all of her comments with, I feel? And I, I realized, and I didn't understand what these institutions were training people who wanted to be artists to do and to be and how to think. And so I said, maybe I won't call myself an artist anymore. So for a while, I just said, I make things. That's how I, I translate that. But I call my, I, uh, when people ask me what I do, I say I'm a citizen artist. Uh, this is my front porch in Homewood. That's Zoe. <sighs> and um, I would, I, I, I bought a house. I never thought I would buy a house. People used to always tell me if I didn't go to college, I'd be a loser. I remember that so clearly, that I would be a loser and that my, I would flip burgers. And I decided a long time ago that it's going to be better for me to flip burgers 40 hours a week than it is to lose my mind uh, with you over there trying to be what, what you say is successful and trying to make what you say is a life. I'll flip burgers 40 hours a week and make stuff the rest of my breath, with the rest of my breath. And so I was sort of surprised. I was sort of surprised that I came to a place where people bought the stuff that I made and that I was able to buy a house. Because I had sort of internalized this idea that I was going to be broke and destitute and mentally ill as a life. But then I had a girlfriend once who was like, you know that's not true, right? There is no law that says that, that what you love cannot sustain you. So I would work and have this experience of love and this, uh, this perception of time really shifting when I was in my studio. And when I had that time, I realized that what I was experiencing was um, a tangible atmosphere of love. And I realized, I was like, that's what people mean when they say there's power in love and there's power in art. It is the deeply life-affirming process of making choices, of trusting your instincts, of listening to the inside of the inside of the inside of yourself, not having to explain it to anyone, and having that dimensional communication with you and your people, because your people are inside of you, you know? They're in your DNA. It's just like physiologically a true thing. You are your people. Right? And so I would be having conversations like, I get it. This is what they were talking about when the bumper sticker said there's power in art. This is it. <laughs> Whoo, I felt like I had the answers, y'all. <laughs> and, uh, and one of the answers was the sculptures were getting too big for the basement. <laughs> And I was like, you just got to keep working. You got to keep pushing and pressing. So I would work on my front porch. And the kids in the neighborhood, they would see me working because I live at the intersection where there's a bus stop. And people would be waiting for the bus, watching me. Adults would watch me, and they would be so suspicious. <laughs> Adults would be like, that's scary. <laughs> that, that voodoo? You do voodoo? You, is this voodoo house? <laughs> You know, they, that really happened. But kids would watch me and they'd be like, why are you so dirty? Because <laughs> I would be wearing my art clothes. And y'all know how it is, you know, looking good is a way of communicating, right? It is, like getting your hair done and your nails done and wearing a new outfit. That is communicating to people something about your worth. There's like, that's one thing that happens. And I didn't care about that. Um, I can't tell you how many times kids would ask me, who did your hair? And I'd be like, why would somebody else need to do my hair? I can do my hair. And um, so, so kids would watch me, and they'd be like, why are you so dirty? And I'd be like, well, I'm an artist. I'm making art. And they'd be like, can, can I help you? And I'd say, no, no. Um, 
Uh, because the truth is, I'm gay. I'm not, I don't ever hide that. I don't have to hide that. But word had been moving around the neighborhood from somebody's grandmother. The kid came to me and said, my grandmother said, Miss Michelle isn't your sister or your cousin. <laughs> and I didn't want people to think that I was grooming kids, being like, here, child, come, have a paintbrush. So I'd be like, no, you can't, you can't, no. Don't you have some place to go? And the kids, would, they would stand at my fence and be like, And, and then what happened is this child right here swung on my fence one day. She was on my fence. You know, you swing on the gate. She was swinging on the gate, and then she threw herself into the yard. She was like, oops. <laughs> Miss Vanessa, I landed in your yard right by this paintbrush. <laughs> <laughs> And I looked at her, and I said, I see what you're doing. And so my girlfriend was a scene designer, and she had all this old scene paint, and she pulled out all the old scene paint and gave it to me. And um, I was poor, so I'd be like, oh, the house that we saw that got demolished earlier, I picked up all the slate from that roof, and I said, you can paint on this. And the kids would be like, well, I'm supposed to paint. And I said, and just anything, you see that old piece of wood from working on the house? Oh, we took molding panning, paneling and we spray painted it to kill the mold. And we were like, paint on that. <laughs> we did, I know, we, me and my girlfriend looked at each other, we were like, eh, you know, it's okay, we spray painted it. <laughs> uh, and they would, I would, I would say, here, there you go, you can do this. Because I tried, they said, can we help you? And I tried to let them help me, but I sort of have a, I have a technical facility with the materials, and I have sort of, I have a really deep understanding of what's happening, and I couldn't transmit that instantly. And so I would say, here, work on this, and I would give them materials, and they'd be like, you know, what would happen first is they'd say, what am I supposed to do? What do we do, Miss Vanessa? And I'd be like, no, that's not, this isn't a school. Um, <laughs> and I would have to explain to them, I'm at work. This is how the gas bill gets paid. I'm working right now. Um, and so what, 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 what do we do? And I said, look, you, you need to make a decision. I said, you start with a color. What's your favorite color? Start with a color. So make a decision. So OK. I said, now ask yourself, wh what do I need to make? So do you need a, somebody's birthday coming up? Do you, do you need a car? Do you, is there a purpose? Can you, can you what, what do you need to do? And they'd be like, okay, so I can, I can think about that. Um, is there something you want to communicate to somebody? You want to tell your teacher you love her, she's a great teacher, but you, you just need to make those decisions. They'd be like, I can handle that. Start with the color that I like, start with that. And then what would happen is that Kids would see their friends at the get off the bus, and they would say to their friends, you want to come and make art? <laughs> no, don't ask Miss Vanessa. She's working. <laughs> uh, go home. Go change clothes. Put, put on your play clothes. Come back. And they would come back, and they'd invite their friends, open the gate, and invite their friends in, and they'd be like, here. And the parent would be like, what am I supposed to do? And the kid would look at him and say, you need to make a decision. <laughs> blew my mind when it happened first. It blew my mind. And I was like, I, I, don't, I don't have to replicate this message. And I was like, oh, something is happening. I experience great love when I'm working. Why, why wouldn't they experience that too? Whether or not they have the language for it, why, why wouldn't that happen for them? And so what happened is they replicated that message. But really all it is is that love always makes more of itself. 
right? And that's what happened. And there came a period of time where kids would come to my house and they, they'd knock on my door, Miss Vanessa, is the porch open today? <laughs> and then I took them into my basement studio. I said, this is also work and I'm working. So we gave it a time, uh, but there would be times it would rain and kids would sit on my porch and watch their art get rained on. <laughs> and they'd be like, why does it get rained on? I'm like, because we're outside. And there was a crisis at a house across the street from me, and I got crisis custody of the kids. I followed an ambulance. I followed the ambulance that they put all the kids in to the hospital, and I did that because the kids were really scared, and they were alone in the back of this ambulance. They put all four kids in the family, and over the course of the night, next of kin came to get the kids. But the question that the social workers asked first, which surprised me, was, have you ever been in handcuffs? So if you had ever been in handcuffs, you could not get crisis custody of the kids because there would be no judge who could waive your criminal record fast enough. And at the end of the night, me and my girlfriend were the only people who could say that we hadn't been in handcuffs. Now, mind you, lots of things I'd be in handcuffs for. And it's probably just a matter of time because I keep losing my temper at community meetings. I'll probably be... <laughs> <laughs> I know it's not, not that I lose my temper, I lose my cool a little bit. My mother is so proud. Um, and so I got crisis custody of these kids. And then I asked the woman who owned the low-income housing company if we could use this house that the kids got put out of as an art house. And she said, no, that's a HUD house. You can't use it. It's families, government, red tape, paperwork. She called me back four days later. She said, I cannot stop thinking about you and this house. I'm going to sneak and let you use it. And she said, we could use the house. And she said, we're going to have to sort of hide it from the HUD guy. And <laughs> she did. Oh, but OK, listen, love is at work. She dropped her kids off at soccer practice and was standing next to this man who looked familiar. And she's like, how do I know you? He said, I'm the regional director for HUD. And she was like, oh. <laughs> and on the spot, she said, there's this house. <laughs> and it's, there's this thing happening in this neighborhood. And uh, she tells him the story, and he says, we can't not let her use the house. So he said, you can use it for four months. And then two and a half years later, <laughs> <laughs> woo! So that woman, that woman was so courageous. I think it can be hard at board meetings and in a corporate environment uh, to be brave on behalf of your heart. But every time they would come around that room and be like, so 7743 Hamilton, what are we going to do with that? She's like, she can stay in it. And people just look at her. She's like, next question. <laughs> she did that every month when they would have that status meeting. And she insured us when we were in there. And I was like, that's fierce. I was like, that's living courage, yo. I don't know. I get scared in situations like that. I'd, be, I'd make up stories. And, you know, she didn't. She was like, next. <laughs> so we moved into this house, um, and most of this I funded myself. I called it art money. <laughs> Whenever I would sell a sculpture, I'd be like, y'all, pizza day. Uh, and, um, and, and I realized that you know, the kids would just be like, we need this, we need this, and I would just sort of keep meeting their needs and meeting their parents' needs. Because the truth is, I like kids, I love kids. Kids are human beings, but I love their parents and their grandparents too. And everybody um, who wants to have access to a space where they can make art and be alive through their imagination, their ideas, they ought to have it. So as you can clearly see here, parents, some, some college students, um, you, that, that baby's like six weeks old <laughs> and that she's looking at right there. And the thing that's amazing about this picture that you can't tell is the two days before, um, during the week, two people got killed at the top of the street. And it was the first time I heard one of my neighbors say, say I'm kind of scared to go outside. And I was like, oh, that's how that thing happens. That's how people isolate. That's how people... Um, disconnect is to protect themselves when they feel fear and I was like and it was the the clearest time it would like crystallize and I was like oh something's happening with people being like I don't even want to look out I don't want to peel back the curtain 
And so what I did, because I, once something happened to me when I decided to live my life and center my life around love, it's that I had to stop paying lip service to it. And what happened, what I, I realized is that to say that I believe in the power of love and to not use that love to do the work that needs to be done, to not actually use the love, is like being a carpenter who looks at a hammer and says that hammer can build a house, but you don't ever pick up the hammer. You just keep looking at it, say, I'm a carpenter, that hammer builds the house, but you have to use it. And I literally had that, I was like just thinking about love and everything, and, and I had this idea, and I was like, oh, carpenter, hammer. And after that, I promise you, I started seeing hammers in the most random places. I was at a bus stop once, and there was a hammer sitting on the bus thing, and I was like, no way. <laughs> and so we, what we did this day was we did something that I called pot love dinner. And I, ba I made chicken. Miss Marge, who lives in this house right here, who is the woman who said, I don't want to go outside. She, uh, is, she bakes pound cakes that are so good, people in her family have had uh, bakery bags professionally printed that say, from the kitchen of Marge Loving. <laughs> and her last name is Loving. And so she made pound cakes, and people brought stuff, and I invited people through our Facebook page. Uh, we have 4,000 Facebook friends, and I was like, we don't have the capacity. I'm like, I just want to see what's going to happen. And people came, and I realized that... Um, by making a spectacle of our love, and by making a, a visible pu public spectacle of being together and not being afraid, or being together and being afraid, but also being courageous, and, and being loving and colorful and joyous and playing music and singing on the street, that it was a disruption, that it disrupted the momentum of fear Kids are prolific, yo. <laughs> Did you see what the kids made last night? Oh, okay, we'll talk about that later. Okay. Sorry. It's so exciting and so beautiful. Molly, raise your hand. <laughs> uh, so this is what happens sometimes. This is my friend right here, Jermaine. He's a great photographer. And I end up have friends who are artists. The art house does not run like a school or like a workshop. What it is, is like it can be your own personal art studio. I open the door and anybody can come in. And most of the time, it's, there's only been one time somebody sketchy came in. It was a little scary. Um, but you know that we move with a force that just is intangible, so we were okay. Um, Anybody can come in, and what happens is um, I have friends who are artists, and they come and they do work, and a kid will stand and be like, what are you doing? I'm, you're crocheting. Can you teach me that? And they bring extra supplies, and there's this sort of moment that is as close to the time of inspiration as possible where they get to act on that inspiration. That's what happens. So um, this is the house. The house has got too small really fast. It was devastating when I would have to turn kids away. And I'd be like, I'm sorry, there's no room. And I know that some kids never forgave me for that. And so time came that we needed to buy our own house. So live, work, love, intention, strategy, beauty, joy, disruption. Um, and where does that all fit in with my sculptures? So I make contemporary power, power figures. You have seen them. And I just said that we move with a force that isn't just tangible. In the material list for all of my sculptures, I include the tangible and the intangible. I always include love, rage. Sometimes I include the phrase, sometimes I want to kill you, because sometimes I feel like that. But I will include um, the shape of togetherness. Blue is deep as water. And so I'm um, making space in my work and in just talking about my work to talk about the, the inside of the inside of the inside, the things that you cannot see, the feeling, the soul, the spirit of a thing. Uh, this is a sculpture uh, that I made called To Call Police, Use This Telephone. I'm so tired of being afraid of the police, y'all. It's exhausting. I drove around with my taillight broke and I was so scared. I thought about Sandra Bland. I thought, you know, Sandra Bland didn't think she was going to be the one. She left the house in the morning like, I got a new job. Going to buy a new suit. Going to feel good. Going to eat dinner. She didn't think she was going to be the one. Now I have to incorporate 
I can't not incorporate into my living system the fact that you don't know. You don't know. Y'all don't know what that's like. Some of you don't know what that's like. But it's extra. Um, they were, New York Times was going to run a picture of this. And the weekend they were going to run it. It was going to be in the Sunday Times. Uh, somebody killed those two police officers and they pulled it. Um, it's in a great collection in D.C. And by great collection, I mean it's this, the African, the, the black woman who founded the, um, the Ellington School. It's in her, you know, it's in her collection. Um, and so she's recollecting because her other collection burned. You can uh, read about that. I found, I have found several bodies in the street. It's devastating. Two men were murdered outside of my house. I found both of them had to call 911, crazy 911 phone calls. Um, and a kind of devastation that's really difficult to put language to. And I will tell you that every shooting is like the same shooting now. Um, this sculpture, and I also feel like I'm, the kids at the house, their parents tell them, don't talk about it. They actually say it. Just be a kid. Don't talk about it. And the kids repeat that. Um, and one kid said to me one day, um, we were, it was one of the first warm days in the spring, and he said to me, Miss Vanessa, you, we could get killed out here. And I was like, Rob, we're, we're, we're not going to get killed. And he was like, look at all these black men. They could kill us. And I was like, that's, that, I was, it blew my mind. And you know, what's, what's crazy is, it was the day Crystal Bridges came to film. Mm -hmm. And so you hear this kid, because they had a mic on me, and he comes into my arms, and the mic's on, and he's whispering all these things. And I'm like, oh my God, we're recording this. I, and I couldn't stop the recording from happening. And uh, so they recorded this kid being like, he could kill us, or he could kill us. And, and they recorded the little girl saying, rah, rah, stop saying that. Don't say that. And I said to him, I said, have you ever found that when somebody tells you to stop thinking something, that it doesn't actually stop you from thinking it? And they were like, yeah, that's true. And they said, well, what do you do with it? And I said, well, I make art with the feeling. Sometimes I just hold the feeling, and then I make things while I'm thinking about that. And we did that. But this uh, sculpture is filled with hand-blown glass vessels. I have a friend who's a black, gay, male family therapist. I felt like he was one of the most rare human beings. <laughs> and um, he cut his locks off. And we hand-blew glass vessels for each one of his locks. Because I felt like they contained all of this information. Because he focuses his life on healing. And so this piece carries all of those. And these are mission bottles that were dug out of the ground um, about a mile away from my house. Those are, this is lead crystal that we blew. I had a residency at a glass center. There is no they. I, there was a, I was sitting on my front porch one day and I heard 21 gunshots at 3 o'clock, and I was like, the kids are getting out the school bus. It was a gunfight, you can tell, because you hear different caliber of guns. You could tell it was like, pop, 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 boom, 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 pop, boom, boom, boom. And you heard, I heard this, and I'm seeing school buses, and I was like, oh, my God. They should do something about this. They should make sure that this never happens. They should keep the kids safe. They should stop all of this from happening. And then I realized there is no they. They do not exist. And I realized that if something was going to happen, I was like, oh, I'm supposed to do it. Like, I just had this thought. I'm supposed to do something with this thought. And it was a primary season, and there were all these political yard signs people had. And so I decided to um, use grant money that a foundation gave me to make art. <laughs> And I told some people, I was like, I want to make these yard signs that look like political yard signs, and we will subversively insert them into the political discourse 
Yes! And my friends, and I expected my friends to be like, yeah, we should do that. Let's get some money together. And they looked at me and they were like, you should do that. <laughs> and I was like, oh, okay. So I definitely took some grant money, y'all. <laughs> and I, I told the foundation, I said, well, the sign is the art and the neighborhood is the gallery. <laughs> And what I actually decided to do that time was stop writing grants. I stopped asking foundations for money. Because I was like, why do I keep trying to do like artistic Cirque du Soleil to fit myself into whatever this is? And so what I did at that time is like, I'm going to try to get a grant for something I'm doing already. And so I wrote a grant to do an artist residency on my own front porch. <laughs> and I got it. <laughs> I made these signs, I was afraid to put it in my yard. And so what I did was, because I was like, who's gonna put up one of these signs in the yard? I went to the Senior Citizen Center. Because senior citizens are curmudgeonly and graceful simultaneously sometimes. They'll be like, Grandma, love you, get off my lawn, you know? <laughs> so, so I went to the Senior Citizen Center on Bingo Day, and they were mad that I was taking their time. They were like, oh, why is she talking to us? She got the yard sign. Somebody at the very back of the, uh, of the Senior Citizen Hall yells, how much do those signs cost? And I said, they're free. And nobody listened to me anymore. It was like this little stampede, <laughs> like right up to the place. And they took all the signs. That was at 11 o'clock in the morning. And then by the afternoon, the signs were out. So when the kids got out of school, they're sort of walking home and they're seeing these signs. And one was in my front yard. And that's how they moved around. This was a day that I took a sign out to hand to somebody. And a car saw us do it on the street. And for probably then after that, Three hours, all we did was hand out these signs because every car, and the bus drivers would stop. People would run signs onto the bus. It was amazing. Um, and so this is the old art house. The new art house is so beautiful. I bought two houses at the end of the street, art money. And because we, you know, I don't know if you know the story of what happened to the August Wilson Center of African American Culture in Pittsburgh, but how it got foreclosed on. And there were all these um, devastating articles in the newspaper like, well, black people really can't have stuff, can they? Like, we can't really expect them to have and do good with them. We're going to take that back. And I was like, this is horrible. And so I was like, nobody's going to be able to take this from us. And so I bought this house. And it's so beautiful. <laughs> so, and beautiful matters. Beautiful matters. Y'all heard the scientists on the TED Talk talk about how, how your brain and your body want beauty. Listen to it. Go do Google that. Yes, it is the truth. I love the word yes. It holds the space. This is us. We, we covered the house. The house is a spectacle. It's real sparkly. Um, we did glass mosaic on the house. Sparkle is important. I had a kid ask me at the art house one day, Miss Vanessa, why did God invent glitter? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's so profound. <laughs> And I was like, for you. <laughs> um, so the, I, you know, anybody can join in on mosaic, one piece at a time, shattered things, making a new and glorious whole, right? So we uh, did a lot of glass mosaic on the house. And this, that's Lele, everybody helping grout. These are my friends from the glass center. That's Jason. He blew a lot of those vessels, the, those glass vessels. Um, so the house is a spectacle. Um, the house is covered in stars also, because I couldn't afford to do all of this. And so I was like, let me ask people to sponsor a star. I'm just, put it on Facebook, let's see what happens. <laughs> and so people from around the country were like, well, here's a star in my mom's name. Do a star for my dog who just died. Here's a star for my daughter. And that accumulated the money to finish the house. So that's one picture of the house. You see this color right here? It's not like that no more. <laughs> And every people came. If I tell you, I have this neighbor named Yvonne. She's like 88 years old. She came, and she worked on one section of the mosaic. And she will definitely bring people over. She's like, I did this. <laughs> 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 Mr. Sam will come up from the street. He'd be like, where's my E at? 
there's my E, there's my E. And I'm like, that's your E, Mr. Sam. Uh, I did paint the house this color. And my neighbors would watch, because I put the color swatches on the house. There was a yellow color and a blue color. My neighbors were like, the yellow. The, uh. They would watch and they'd be like, she chose the blue. And they would come out every day, they'd be like, if you can see that from up the street, Ms. Vanessa, I'd be like, can you? <laughs> Miss Yvonne would be like, hurts my eyes, baby. <laughs> and I was like, not for long. But it's beautiful. It's a spectacle. <laughs> I know, right? It's wonderful to drive up the street for me to come home and to see people standing outside the house with a cell phone, <laughs> taking pictures. It's wonderful to be at my house and watch people slow down and go. It's wonderful to be at my house. And my house, I bought two houses. This is my house, the White House. And it was wonderful to be there, standing out there, and I see men standing there and being like, when I was j in jail, I saw this on the news. <laughs> <laughs> that totally happened to me, too. And, and it's so funny, because there'll be this moment where they'll be like, it's just so beautiful. It makes me happy. It may, and that happens every day. And I'm like, yes, a and you deserve to be happy. Front door. I know. Okay. I know, I'm talking. I'm coming to the end, y'all. It's OK. <laughs> We made a reading room in the art house. And we made the reading room because not every kid wants to be an artist, but sometimes they just want snacks and a moment of peace, <laughs> which we used to happen. Kids would come and they would just sit. And I'd be like, what's happening? And they'd be like, I, this is what I want to do. And I'd be like, I support that. And so I was like, oh, and then they would get mad. They would try to police kids who were loud. They'd be like, you stop. And I'd be like, wait. Well, we can work this out. We can make a space for you. And so we made a reading room. And what's amazing is kids fall asleep in it. Like, I didn't expect that to happen. Sometimes we look in, and there'll be sleeping people there. And I'm like, oh, OK. Sleep, peace. This little girl's name is Peaceful. Her name is Peaceful. And whenever she tells people, they all go, oh. and I'm like, that's exactly what she is. This is Chad. Chad and his uh, crew of friends broke all the windows at the yard house. I called them the window breakers. <laughs> and what then started to happen as they saw everybody else in the neighborhood working on the house, they started to come and say, Miss Vanessa, do you have any work for us? And I'd be like, y'all break my windows? <laughs> no. And so I was like, yeah, y'all make some stars. Chad is saying, right as I'm taking this picture with my iPad, he's saying, he's looking at that star and he says, I can't believe I did this. And then his boys were outside. After I let some of them come in and work on the stars, they broke into the house. And they piled up all my tools, but I caught them. And they ran out the back. And later when I saw them, I said, you know, I would never do that to you. Like, I would never spend time with you and then break into your house. And I didn't know what else to say. Like, I didn't know, like, what a psychologist would say to a kid who just broke into somebody's house. But I said, I looked at them, and I, I, I said, I wouldn't do that to you. And I tell you, they're so protective of that house now. And um, people, somebody on my Facebook page got mad, and they were like, why do you bully those little boys and call them the window breakers? And I said, they're minors. I'm not going to tell you their name on the internet. And I call them that because this entire house is covered with broken things. And these broken things have been joined together strategically and intentionally to create a picture that is whole. And because those broken parts came together, the house shines and it sparkles. <laughs> and <laughs> and they, they called me a bully. And I was like, that's not what bullying is. Um, check yourself. <laughs> but I didn't have to do that, because other people on the Facebook page were like, please. <laughs> and I was like, oh, thank you. That's Mr. Greg <laughs> putting on. Look, he is so happy to do that. Um, beauty is a disruptive force, yes. 
Everywhere you take your joy and your beauty, you disrupt Mr. Trump. <laughs> I was listening to the Diane Reem show one day, and they were talking about all the protests in Ferguson and everywhere else, and the woman from the think tank in Chicago thought that it was appropriate to keep using the phrase, the blacks. Well, the blacks keep killing themselves. The blacks need to figure out their community. The blacks need to do that. And nobody on the panel stopped her. They let her do that. So then I was like, OK, I'm going to do a photography series called The Blacks. <laughs> and this is part of the series, The Blacks. This is at the Hidden Graffiti Field in Homewood. And what happened is I would take a model who was dressed up like one of my power figures, and we would walk through the neighborhood, and I would photograph them. People would stop their cars. They would get out. They would say, this is so beautiful. Can I take a picture? I'm going to put it on Instagram. Look at the smile on dude's face. <laughs> Look at her. She's just, she just, she just standing. I'm just filming all of it. I'm just all of it. Now, I'm going to be a film man. I'm putting something together. I'm inspired. And that's why it was so inspiring to just move around the neighborhood like that. Filmmaker Chris Ivey, Hidden Graffiti Field, The Blacks. Celeste, 70 years old, at the art house right now. Glorious, beaming, full of light. You can see miracle that rising up off her teeth. Look right there. Miracle. <laughs> Flawlessness, yes. Flawless is Anquanique Winfield, the opera singers. And when, this is what happens when you move through the neighborhood with some beauty, taking some pictures, all fancied up. The kids be like, um, can I do that too? <laughs> can I do that? that? This is what happened. And then, more, then their friends come. And then they're like, uh, can we all take some special pictures? <laughs> Ra Ra just wanted a crown. Look at him. He's just going to hold it in place. <laughs> That's peaceful. Yes, everywhere, right? Everywhere we go. Everywhere. That's what I'm talking about. That's Zoe's sister, the woman you saw. Isn't she beautiful? <laughs> Whoo! Taking my breath away. Was it? She was a great model. Spoons. Everything means something. The spoons for the power to scoop in and bring in the love and dip out the bitterness, y'all. Right? Everything love is a healing. Believe it. Say it out loud with me. One, two, three. Everything love is a healing. And we, there's so much healing that needs to be done, right? There's so much healing. That's the work of the future. It is the work of the future. Healing in the earth and healing the connection between us as human beings. I introduced Bill Clinton at the, at the, at the Creative Summit, and he had a speech rolled up in his hand. He's like, I can't even read the speech. I'm not going to read the speech. This is what I know after moving the world and doing all these things, that we are more connected than the story gives us credit for. That's what I know. And so the work is to, the work is to bring those connections back together. And it's so fitting that we're in a museum because museums have a wonderful role to play in helping us to heal and helping us to create futures and new stories for ourselves. I'm not gonna preach because we ain't got that much time. Uh. <laughs> Trust it, believe it, become a member. I'm sponsoring four memberships. So if you need a membership, you're gonna get the love membership. That's what I just, <laughs> everything love is a healing. That's the man I was telling you about earlier. He is the son of the woman who gave Billy Strayhorn piano lessons. He still plays the piano at the Good Samaritan service. Uh, isn't he beautiful? OK. I have a thing. He's beautiful. Uh, he's, he's beautiful. We, uh, when they were about to demo the house a couple nights before, we went in, and we helped him get out what we could. He said, because he had been living in his car. What does it say? It's true. This is the day that we started taking the signs out and cars started stopping. We did not plan this. But you see all those people? They start parked their cars and started to help hand out the signs. The kids are used to making art at the art house, so they wanted to make their own signs, and I let them. And this started to happen.
That's me <laughs> on the porch. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much.